I'd like to introduce Dr. Diane Powell. She's a John Hopkins trained neuropsychiatrist and neuroscientist, former Harvard faculty member, and an award-winning author and clinician. She currently has a private practice in Oregon. Her current research focuses on investigating parental reports of telepathy and precognition in autistic children and has been presented at the annual Science of Consciousness Conference, the Parapsychological Association Conference, and the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Dr. Powell began studying autism in 1987 when she spent six months with Sir Michael Rudder at the Institute of Psychiatry in London. She's also an expert on PTSD and co-created psychiatry programs for survivors of torture and the McCandless Women's Center in San Diego. She has served as a member of the Think Tank on Human Consciousness at the Salk Institute, as the Director of Research for the John E. Mack Institute, and on the boards of John Houston Foundation and Forever Family Foundation. She's a former secretary of the Board of Parapsychological Association. She has also authored two books, The ESP Enigma, A Scientific Case for Psychic Phenomena, and the 2007 Shift Report, Evidence of a World Transforming. So for the next 90 minutes, she'll be sharing with us a fascinating topic, telepathic savants, what do they say about how brains might really function? So please, join me and welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Diane Powell. Thank you. It, it's, an, it's an honor to be your keynote, and I have so much respect for the Monroe Institute and, and what that their contribution has been to science. And um, I'm really delighted to be able to present to you a theory that I've been working on for um, well over a decade, and it's got some interesting uh, twists and turns in it, and um, you'll be hearing this here for the first time. Let me just say a little bit about my background because it's very unusual for someone with my background to become interested in phenomena such as ESP. And the reason why I became interested in that is that as a neuroscientist wanting to understand what the brain is and how, how it relates to consciousness, it's really important that we consider anything that has really uh, valid data into our theory. We can't throw out data just because it doesn't fit our theory. We really need to look at that data and see what, what, what does that tell us. And it's in that information that doesn't fit in with the paradigm that science advances itself. My interest was primarily in human consciousness, which is one of the reasons why I went on to medical school rather than doing research on animals and went into psychiatry because I was truly interested in understanding the connection between people's inner experiences and their behavior and how that related to brain function. And while practicing as a psychiatrist at Harvard and consulting to the medical floors and surgical floors when they had a, a patient that they thought needed to be evaluated for um, something such as um, being mentally ill and wanting to leave the hospital against medical advice when, when they um, really are not capable of making that decision for themselves. When, when, when evaluating a patient like this, I was really blown away. My, my entire world was turned upside down when I met this patient who within five minutes of meeting her claimed to be psychic and then started doing a reading on me. And she knew so many things about me that it, it just didn't make sense how she could know those things. And once I discovered that there actually is a large body of research on these kinds of phenomena, I, I was hooked. And part of why I was open-minded to the, the idea that these phenomena might be real is also because as a, as a neuropsychiatrist, I knew about cases of people called autistic savants. And that's where I've been focusing my research is on savants. And my interest in autism really began back when I was in high school. 
And a friend of mine gave me a book about a boy. He wasn't given the diagnosis of autism at the time, but um, he really had all of the hallmark symptoms of it. He, he was not socializing with people. He was um, playing by himself. He wasn't speaking with people and he really was living in his own little world. And that's actually where autism comes from. It comes from autos, which is self. And this little boy was in therapy with a woman named Virginia Axline. And in her work with him, she enabled him to come out of this shell that he was in. And she discovered that he was a really very uh, bright child and, and very advanced. And I was inspired by that and was wondering if there were other children like him, and, and indeed there are, and, and they've increased in numbers such that I've been able to, to work with them. And Savant syndrome is found more commonly in people with autism than it is in any other condition. Uh, approximately 10% of autistic um, individuals um, can have a, a savant skill. And many of these skills are, um, can be accounted for by just an incredible memory. But, but some of these skills cannot be accounted by just purely by rote memory. And one example of this is a set of identical twins who were institutionalized back in the 60s and they were investigated by Oliver Sacks because they had a skill in which they could tell you prime numbers in six digits that were consecutive to one another. And in fact, it was a game that they would engage in. And when Oliver Sacks went to, to test them, he gave them an eight digit prime number to see what they do with it. And then within minutes, they started telling him prime numbers and the eight digits that were consecutive. And the reason why this is very remarkable is that a prime number is a number that's only divisible by itself and one. And when you're getting into that many digits, it is a very, very complicated algorithm that is helpful in recognizing a prim, prime, but we don't really have a good algorithm for generating primes. Even more remarkably, Oliver Sacks tested them for 12 digit primes, which were also accurate. They even gave him 20 digit primes, but at the time, the computers were not capable of that kind of uh, calculation. And so he was not able to validate those. Now, what's interesting about this phenomena is that the twins would tell you that they did not derive the answers, that the answers just appeared to them. In other words, they said that they would just see a number out in physical space in front of them and they would just read it off. And that is actually very similar to how um, people who are professional psychics oftentimes say that they receive the information is that it really is more of a um, direct sensation of it, of a, a, either a hearing of it or a, um, a visual experience of it. And that um, it's not something that they derive. In fact, if they try to derive it, that's when they start to get into problems. Um, this is Daniel Tamet, and he is um, someone who is another savant. And what he has is a prodigious memory. And part of what aids that memory is a condition called synesthesia. He, um, at the age of 25, won this contest that happens on March 14th every year, which is Pi Day, because the first three digits of Pi are um, 3.14. And he was able to recite it to over 22,500 um, digits. 
And the reason he's able to do that is that he has a perception of each number has a different color and shape associated with it. And he just sees it as like a little like ticker tape parade of all of these moving shapes and, and of different colors in front of him. So he says it's effortless for him to remember this. Uh, it was a, a patient that I actually was called to consult on when I was at Harvard who um, started telling me things about myself that, that, that there's no way she could tell me within five minutes of meeting me. And, um, and she also told me things that, um, very specific things that happened in the future. And um, there are accounts of that in my book and, 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 and videos of me elsewhere. Um, and it made me realize as a scientist that um, the psychic abilities really um, need to be taken um, as a, you know, a serious line of investigation. And then I discovered that there are people who've been taking them seriously for um, over a century. And I started to think about how similar the, the, these accounts were with what the autistic savants could do. Uh, because some of these savants could do things like um, draw a periodic table uh, complete with all the atomic elements, and yet they had never been exposed to that information. And so it's, it's somehow they are able to access what, what some people would call as non-local information. And, um, and that's another way of describing um, psychic abilities. But one of the differences is that savant syndrome is significantly more reliable. And so one of the problems that scientists have had in terms of demonstrating that these abilities are real is that people are expecting such extraordinarily um, accurate results that it's really hard to reproduce in the laboratory. But with the savant syndrome, that it was reliable as uh, the sun rising and, and setting every day. Another thing about savants is that they have a very high accuracy of detecting signals. Um, you, there are a lot of musical savants who have perfect pitch, for example, and they're able to, um, there are the people that are visual savants that are able to uh, see Waldo in a complex image, for example, and pick, find Waldo um, almost instantaneously. Um, or to, um, if you were to spill a, a canister of matches on the uh, on the floor, count them exactly um, and instantaneously. Um, another thing is that. Um, psychic abilities are more common in people who are in dreaming sleep, which, um, which made me interested in um, looking at people whose brain activity uh, mimics that of dreaming sleep, because we know in dreaming sleep which parts of the brain are very active and which parts of the brain are more dormant. And so there are certain syndromes in which you, you find that. And one of the characteristics of this pattern that is um, more conducive to psychic abilities is for the right hemisphere to be more dominant than the left hemisphere, which is the opposite of how it is during normal waking um, life for most of us. Uh, yeah. And the right hemisphere is associated with intuition, um, gestalt thinking, creativity, um, dreaming, as I said. And then the other thing about these savants is that they have a very high tolerance for monotony. And, and one of the problems that you run into in experiments with um, subjects, getting them to um, demonstrate psychic abilities is that they can get, um, that there's a fatigue in the phenomena. They, they oftentimes do better in the beginning than they do at the end. And with, with um, savants, they can, I've had a um, subject where I was doing, um, two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon for three days in a row um, and getting 97% um, accuracy. And so with, with randomized um, stimuli. And so that, that is really, um, that's just unheard of with, 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 um, with other types of subjects. Um, 
And then once I started looking into these um, these uh, autistic savants, I, I found that they also had um, reported a lot of the other phenomena that um, fall into that rubric of um, parapsychology, uh, such as um, seeing auras, very common for them, see auras. Um, and um, a lot of them have these out of body experiences. Um, and they have a different perception of time. And this is something that has been described in autism in general, um, is that if you have two notes that are separated from one another, that the people with autism will collapse them and, and experience them as occurring simultaneously with a, a, a longer gap between the notes, which suggests that their brain works at a, at a, um, at a, at a different um, rate. And here is um, a, a savant uh, whose name is Jason Paget. And um, the, the reason why I'm telling you about him is that he demonstrates something called acquired savant syndrome. And what that is, is that someone can be a rather ordinary person and then have an accident and develop savant abilities. And he was working as a futon salesman and he was leaving a karaoke bar when he was assaulted and um, suffered some um, head injury. And um, when he was recovering from that, everywhere he looked, he saw fractals. And he ended up going back to school and becoming a mathematician. And he, he looks at these fractals as um, a major organizing principle. And he's um, um, very well respected for his ability in math. And yet um, that was not an interest at all of his before this head injury. Um, when you look at his brain using imaging to see what part of his brain is the most active, it is the area there that is um, sort of a, a little darker orange, um, and that's the angular gyrus. And the, the angular gyrus is very interesting because of the fact that if you stimulate it, um, you can uh, mimic at least a partial out of body experience. This was something that um, was demonstrated by some uh, scientists in Sweden. And the other thing is that the angular gyrus is where synesthesia um, seems to be associated because it's the crossroads of the various cortices for the different senses. And a lot of the synesthesia um, syndromes are um, where there's a blending of two senses. For example, hearing a sound and seeing a color at the same time. But the angular gyrus is also associated with symbolism. And it is, um, it, it's associated with symbolism and mathematics. And it was this area of the brain that had increased myelin um, in Einstein's brain. And, and we know of him as being somebody who was not only um, very gifted at math, but he also did thought experiments about navigating space time. And interestingly, people with uh, savant syndrome um, oftentimes will, uh, as I said, they, 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 they can navigate space time differently than, than how we do. And what's interesting is Temple Grandin, who, who's a, um, probably one of the most famous autistic savants, she is a, an agriculture professor and it's because she was able to conceptualize things like the, the, the livestock that she consults about, that she was able to help them design better, um, better systems for getting the, the animals to do what they wanted them to do. For, 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 for example, mass vaccination or, or even going to their own slaughter. And when she describes her ability to design these systems, um, similar to the way an architect would design things, she says that instead of being able to conceptualize it in her mind, um, what it would look like from a sky view, she imagines her herself 
going up into the up into the um, atmosphere above something and and looking at it from up there. So so she so she shifts where her body is relative to something rather than manipulating it in her eyes mind. Um, whereas someone like Tesla, the way he described his inner process of engineering was that he could design something entirely in his inner mind and, um, and then execute it um, flawlessly. The, the first autistic savant that I evaluated is a boy named Vishal. And his name um, in Sanskrit means limitless or infinite. And when I met him, he was, I went over to India and he was about six years old. And he was one of these children whose, um, whose parents said that he had special abilities. And at the time, she, the, the main one she was promoting was that he had knowledge of science without any exposure to it. And so I went over there to evaluate him and I asked him various questions that had um, scientific answers and asked him to do um, math, for example, square roots and, and, and that sort of thing. And he was able to answer those questions. And I was very, I was very impressed with him. And then the mother said something to me and she said, oh, by the way, he's also telepathic. And then I thought, oh no, <laughs> if he's telepathic, then how do I know that he really, um, it, that, 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 that could be a confounding variable. And, that's one of the reasons why I realized that I had to investigate whether or not these children really were telepathic because of, of that and also the implications of telepathy. And one of the things, I'm showing this image again, one of the things for you to know is that um, a lot of these children who are diagnosed, diagnosed as autistic, um, their problem is not really in the expression of language, I'm sorry, their problem is not really in the reception of language. In other words, they understand the language that's being spoken around them. Their, their problem is in the expression of it. And because of that, they need to have someone assist them in um, learning how to manipulate their, their organs that uh, are used in expression. And this area that's in blue, Broca's area, is the part of the brain that's involved in uh, the motor expression of language. And that's oftentimes the area of the brain that's affected in these kids. And it gets affected during development. And um, so they have come up with various tools, um, such as laptops that have um, helped these children to finally communicate and it's opened up a whole new world of, um, of, of, of research because of our ability to now find out exactly what it is that, that, that they're thinking. And this is a girl named Nananda who is, um, she's uh, Indian by nationality, but she was living in Dubai when um, it was, uh, her mother reported that she was um, able to read her own thoughts. And she was investigated by a, a pediatrician and some other people in India um, who, um, and Dubai, who combined their, their work together and um, found to, yes, indeed, she, uh, you know, she is telepathic. And unfortunately, I didn't find out about her until um, after I had come back to the States and, um, and I had actually even passed through Dubai. Um, but um, I found shortly after that, I found um, a, another um, person who was just like her. And um, her name is Haley. And she, um, she's sitting here on the sofa with uh, Daryl Treffer, who is a psychiatrist like myself. And he was, um, during his um, residency, um, he ran into um, a savant in his training and that became his area of expertise. And he's um, probably most uh, widely known for the fact that he was the consultant for Rain Man, the, the movie that really popularized the, uh, the, the idea of savant syndrome. And, and the person who was the real, um, the, the real Rain Man was uh, Kim Peek. 
be, because of the um, because of the fact that these children needed to type on a um, a keyboard or sometimes use a stencil and and pointing to the the letters on the stencil in order to communicate. It, um, it, it provided me an opportunity to gather data and to present it at scientific conferences and do it with um, cameras that were recording everything from um, all angles. But one of the concerns people had was um, that they, they just found it hard to believe and they, they thought, oh, you know, how do we know that there isn't something going on with, with the keyboard or, or with the iPad, or, you know, how do we, so, so, so what I, what I did was I, I, I found another child who, who could talk and had these same abilities and, um, and that is Ramsey's. And part of how I find these children is that that people know about me. They'll 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 see me in an interview on, on YouTube, and um, they will they'll contact me and say I have a kid just like that. And um, and then if they if I see that the child is going to be able to um, offer something that I haven't already done, then then I'm I'm interested in, in being able to go and, and see them and investigate them. And with Ramses, um, one of the advantages is that he could speak. And so that made it much easier for me to, to do these telepathy experiments with him and have him um, to, to say in front of in the camera what it was. And, and, and there just was no question about it. Um, and the other thing about him that I was really intrigued by is that he has <clears throat> a, a savant syndrome that is called hyperlexia. And hyperlexia is when these children are able to read at a very, very advanced level at a very young age. Oftentimes they, they start reading at four months. And Ramses, um, by the by the age of two, the, the mother reported that he could read and even speak um, eight languages. And uh, these included uh, Hindi, um, Hebrew, Arabic, Japanese, Russian, Spanish. And these were all languages that were fairly distinct from one another. And the mother said that she, she really didn't have any, um, she hadn't exposed him to these. Of course she had exposed him to the English and the Spanish because she was Spanish speaking. And he was um, at six months, they were stationed in Japan. So he was exposed to that, but she didn't know where he was getting the Hindi and the Hebrew and the Arabic. And so I, um, I, I learned about him when he was five years old and um, went and visited him and started to do some research with him. And um, so this is in their, their home there and the paintings on the wall are uh, the mothers. She was a, um, a, she still is a brilliant surreal artist and um, her family are all very, very talented artists. And I'm holding there that yellow piece of paper is um, his, um, some of his writing of, of some of the symbols. And I was having to use my computer to check to see, um, you know, what, you know, what was what. And, and indeed, I mean, he was very accurate. He really truly did know the, um, um, at least the alphabets and, and the ability to read um, um, uh, several of those languages. My, um, my most recent research has been with a boy named Akil, and um, he is very similar to Haley in the sense that he is highly accurate. And he, um, and he types um, on a keyboard as opposed to speaking. And the, the reason why I, I did research with him was that with Ramses, um, he couldn't do, he, he, he would, his attention span was such that I, it was hard to get him to sit down and do more than um, six to 10 stimuli at a time. And also his, his grandmother really um, 
doesn't like the idea of it didn't didn't want him to participate in telepathy experiments anymore because of her um, Christian beliefs. And so I, I honored that. And, um, and with the keel um, I met him at a, at a wonderful time and 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 the mother really um, is very interested in people understanding the the, the potential that that uh, we all have as, as human beings but also the potential that um, that these children have and so I, I've, I've done, I've conducted uh, experiments over several different days on different occasions with Akil, and some of them were, at, were, were witnessed by Deepak Chopra, who, who, who came with um, the, uh, the chief um, scientist on his board and, um, and witnessed it. And he was so blown away by uh, how accurate he was that he, that he actually forgot his, uh, his uh, backpack and his uh, jacket. Um, and, and the back of that had his wallet in it. And so, so we had to arrange for a car to get to, um, to take it to him to, to New York. Um, but um, so, so having seen that, that the abilities that these children have firsthand and also having gone back in the literature and having seen that there are case reports of um, telepathy in, in children who were autistic and in children in a child who is blind that were done under very highly controlled um, circumstances. But it's just that they got kind of buried in the literature. And, and when I, but when I saw that, I thought instead of continuing to just focus on the um, finding more and more experimental proof, um, I, I think that it's really time to look at, you know, what is our model for understanding this? Because I think that that is one of the major hangups is, is trying to understand what is, what's going on in somebody who has these abilities. And this is just to show you an example. Um, this is my computer where I, um, I, I just randomly came up with um, these objects and, and created a random uh, order of the list. And then that's what the mother would look at. And then this is um, Akil's answer. So he, he would, um, so here he, for some reason, he was starting to, to type maple and, and then he moved down here. But, but that's what I mean by, um, you know, really, really high accuracy is, um, it, it, it's, it's pretty astounding. Um, this, the reason why I'm showing you this picture of Leslie Lemke is he illustrates another type of savant and that is the blind savant. And um, he, he, was, um, he was also had cerebral palsy and wasn't able to walk until he was 15. And he was adopted by a woman um, who really, who took him in a, as an infant because he was really abandoned. He, 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 he was blind and, 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 and really um, total, total care child, but she worked with him, um, relentlessly worked with him to teach him how to walk. And um, one day he, he surprised her at the age of 16 when he sat down at the piano and pay, played uh, Tchaikovsky's uh, piano concerto number one after having heard it on the television. And it, 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 it literally blew her away. And um, so he's somebody who performed um, in, in all kinds of concert halls for people because of this remarkable gift that he had to be able to hear music and, and to be able to flawlessly reproduce it and play it. And interestingly, just like there are, um, so the, the autistic savants have been, um, have this ESP. There, there's also a history of people who are blind seers. And, and one of the most famous is Baba Banga, who was Bulgarian. And she, she lived in um, from, uh, I think, 1911 until 1977 or so. And she made many predictions about what would happen uh, during this century. And, um, and a lot of them, people say, have, have come true. A lot of people believe that um, that she really did have the, these special abilities. And so when I, as a 
neuropsychiatrist, when I, I, when I think about these things and I'm trying to model what's going on, I think, okay, we've got two, let's, let's assume we've got two types of um, savant syndromes and that really we're, that the psychic abilities is not that different from savant. Uh, in fact, uh, Bernard Rimland, who had an, who was a psychologist, who had a son who was autistic, and he um, he founded uh, the Autism Research Institute down in San Diego. He studied thousands of autistic children and um, and many savants, and he believed that ESP was a savant skill, and, and he found it in about three percent of them. Um, so I was wondering, what so what do um, they they have in common? Well. One of the things is, is they had had extensive rewiring their brain. Um, and, and so the question is, well, what, what is that rewiring? I mean, what, and, 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 and what is it doing? Um, so one of the things that I discovered is that the most telepathic children um, were, the, were the children who had their ability to um, express language interrupted at a very, very early age. And, um, and so I found that they were more telepathic than Ramses, even though Ramses is it's pretty telepathic, but I think he has to struggle more to stay in that space. But these children who um, had their, their language taken away, their ability to express language taken away, it's at, um, at a year and a half, right when they're in the middle of developing it, because this is the regressive form of autism. Those children, um, it made me wonder whether or not they they were really tapping into a default communication mechanism that is there in infants between infants and their mothers, and that is really uh, instrumental in helping us to acquire language. And that it, it that it somehow then you know once we acquire language it, it goes uh, it goes underground uh, for the most part, and and then if that's the case, um, I, I wondered you know could this explain why um, there is there are so many reports of animals seeming to be able to communicate with one another in a way that it, it, it cross species it it, it, it that you you have to wonder. And, and one of my favorite stories is of someone who um, was a diver and he was um, swimming among the fish and really enjoying the, 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 um, the experience. And then the thought dawned on him, um, oh, I could have one of these for dinner. And then immediately they dispersed. And Native Americans um, also talk about there, there being this, um, that, that all the species are really connected with one another. And yet, you know, what's wrong with the two-legged species? What, why is it that we're so disconnected? Similarly, I wonder with, with the blind, um, how, how are they, you know, what's going on with the blind? Is, is there an alternative system for sight besides um, the, the, the one that we associate with the eyes. And one of the, one of the pieces of, I, I love to collect uh, puzzle pieces. And one of them is uh, the, these reports of memories uh, that have a visual contact uh, content to them that, that occur in, um, that really had, that had to have been um, when the infant was still in the womb. And, um, and you know how is that possible? So, uh, getting back to basics, then I, 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 I let's ask the first question of why why do we have a brain? And and there's there's a um, species of a, a tunicate, the sea squirt that um, doesn't have a brain during most of its um, cycle, but it. Um, or during most of its life um, until it needs to navigate somewhere, relocate, and, and then um, it grows something that looks <laughs> similar to a human brain in some ways um, in, in terms of the corrugations and whatnot, but it, they, they grow that and, and while they're having to navigate, and then as soon as they, they settle down, then, then they get rid of it because it's a, a brain is a very energy intense um, organ. It, it requires um, a high percentage of the amount of fuel that we put into our 
bodies. Now, looking at navigation, um, one of the, the most primitive um, uh, instruments of navigation is uh, magnetite, which is found in organisms that um, from uh, bacteria all the way up to, to worms, all the way up to um, human beings. And um, this is um, showing you um, a bacteria that has these little um, these, these little black dots there are, are actually magnetite uh, that's, um, that has a little membrane around them. And this is an organelle that, that helps the bacteria um, navigate the earth because of the electromagnetic fields around the earth. And if you, if, so, so one of the things in order to understand a lot of phenomena you you have to you you have to look at the relationship between the 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 magnetic the electromagnetic field that we all are in um, and and the impact that that has on us this is this is um, this is showing you where, when I say we have magnetite um, in our brains, um, this, this is showing you where it's located. So we, we have a membrane that's right, um, that hugs the, the brain and, and this is full of magnetite. And then there is a membrane that, that hugs the skull that's full of magnetite. And it's a, it's a um, 100 um, million uh, particles per gram here in these membranes. In the brain itself, it's at 5 uh, million uh, particles uh, per gram. And so, so there's, there's some function that, um, that it's playing here. It's also found um, similar to birds. Birds have magnetite in their beaks, which they uh, believe enables them to migrate um, long distances using the magnetic uh, field lines of the earth. We also have magnetite in the equivalent of our beaks. And this is another bone that um, composes the, the, the nose. And then this is the sphenoid bone, which is unique in the skull in that it really, um, it, it, first of all, it looks like this butterfly, um, and, but, but what, what's unique about it is that it is in contact with all of the other cranial bones of, of the skull. Um, it's the only one like that. Um, and it's also there at the base of the brain. And if you look at, um, so if you imagine, then you've got you, you you've got some magnetite here in, in very concentrated uh, in the bone, in addition to in the membranes, and you've got you've got it here, you've got it here, you've got it here, and then you have magnetite that actually is going down the spinal column, um, in it, because it also is lined with that that same. Um, uh, membrane um, that, that has magnetite in it. But most of the magnetite, interestingly, creates this sort of triad, uh, you know, these right up there. And it's perfect for you've got it on each side, um, just like we have ears on each side of the, um, of, of the skull. We, we, we have this magnetite strips here and then one in the front. So it, 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 there's some orienting um, uh, role that that plays. And I think it kind of looks almost like the, the symbol psi. Um, we also have um, in the back of our eyes, we, we have um, not only the, the rods and cones that give us, um, the cones giving us color vision and the rods giving us um, you know, more black and white and dim vision, um, peripheral vision. We have cryptochromes, which actually can detect magnetic fields. Robin Baker is, um, he, he was a um, psychologist in England who discovered that if he blindfolded the students and had them try to find their way home, 
that um, that they that they could, but that if you put a magnet on top of their um, head, they couldn't find their way home. It, it was disorienting for them. And um, he he did research with them for over a decade and and, and published it. And um, and I think that this is really significant um, evidence that we we do have this sense, but it's not a sense that we um, give much credit to. It, it's a it's a unconscious sense that we have. There was. Um, When, when I first heard about uh, research that had been done on animals that, that, that showed that they, had, um, that they had these cells that are what are called place cells and grid cells that enable um, an animal to know where it is in its environment. When I first heard about this, I thought that is like a GPS system because there are, there are neurons that will fire only when an animal is in a, a specific area of its territory. And there are other neurons that will fire only when, it, when you're, you're going across these like sort of like grid lines. And this GPS system has actually been found to exist in human beings as well. Um, so, more evidence that 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 our brains are um, that they play a major role in in our ability to navigate space time, but this is talking about space time in a local way, um, and um, and I I believe that we also are capable of navigating space time in a non-local way, which is which is what the savants do. They're just different systems. Um, this, this is a blind savant and he um, named Daniel Kish and he is able to live an extraordinarily close to normal life, including mountain climbing, um, despite being uh, completely blind. And the reason why is because he does something called echolocation. And in echolocation, he, he emits these little clicking sounds from his, from his tongue and his mouth. And then he's able to use the, 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 the sounds that bounce off of objects. He's able to decode that and, and map out the, the world for himself and navigate it quite well. And um, I see that we're covering over this, um, this image here of, um, I'm gonna go back. Um, it's covering over um, the image here, but, but if you were to see this, what you would see is that the visual cortex is recruited and used for this skill. And, and this was an experiment that was done that, that demonstrated that indeed that, that, that it, it was used for that. Similarly, people who are musical savants who are blind will recruit the visual cortex and use it for, um, for an additional auditory purposes, which just gives them extraordinary uh, um, skills. This is the opposite of, of um, where you have a, a, a visual cortex that is um, driving the show. This is a person who, who had a stroke that took out her visual cortex. And so you, as you can see here, this is, this is a picture from the back. This is a picture from the side. And you know, this is where the visual cortex is. And this is this woman's brain, um, Lena Koenig, and she has what's called Ridox syndrome. And what's interesting about Ridox syndrome is that she can only perceive something if it's moving. And so for example, if she were to run water in her kitchen sink, she would see the running water, but she wouldn't see the faucet or the sink. And she would see it go down the drain, but she, would, she wouldn't see anything that's stationary. 
And the only way that she can see some things is if she rocks her body because she has to be moving relative to something to see it. And so if you can imagine what that's like uh, for someone like this, um, and, and, it, and it gives you an idea of how the, the, the nervous system prioritizes uh, our ability to, to navigate if we're moving or something's moving toward us. And, and so what little bit of visual cortex and a little bit of brain that she could use to create that sort of virtual reality, which, are, which our visual cortex does, to, to create that, that it, it prioritized uh, m motion. This is a, a picture of Kim Peek, and he is the, the person that Rain Man was modeled after. And he had a phenomenal uh, memory. He was, um, he was a prodigious reader, and in fact, was able to read two books simultaneously, one with each eye. And he had read over 12,000 books by the time that he was um, in his late 50s, and could recite them to you word for word, forwards and backwards. And when you think of that kind of memory, um, initially a lot of people look at him and they'll say, well, he's got a really large head. And in fact, his head was so large that he had difficulty holding it upright. And, that, and that's why you see it tilted at an angle there. And Initially, uh, people were thinking, well, gee, he must have massive amount of brain um, tissue and, and just have more of this because the neuroscience has been so focused on the neurons that they have, um, th that they've made these assumptions that, that uh, more memory is about increased connectivity and, and that sort of thing. But when you look at his brain, what you see, this is a normal brain, what you see is that First of all, he's missing, he's, he's missing the corpus callosum, which is the major um, connection between the left and the right hemisphere. It, it's totally gone. And in fact, he has this huge hole. This is all cerebrospinal fluid here, uh, where, where you see that the, the, the black, you know, the darkest color is just pure water in, in this kind of imaging. And so he really actually, instead of having um, autism, a lot of people assume that, that he was autistic. Actually, he has a condition called hydrocephalus, which, which in the past was um, called uh, water on the brain. And it occurs as a result of something blocking the, the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid. And when I when, when you look up hydrocephalus and you wanna know, well, how does hydrocephalus clinically present itself? One of the things I found very interesting is that um, you know, it, the, the list includes social learning disorders, extensive rote memories, poor coordination, precocious puberty, and enlarged heads. And a lot of the children that I've been evaluating um, or I hear about, a lot of them, these things fit them. And, and I, um, so I think what's happening is, is that we're seeing um, children who display the, these uh, social learning disorders and, and some problems with language and um, we're, we're labeling them autism. And, and actually what we're doing is we're, we're lumping a lot of children together that have very, very different brains from one another. So that was one of the things that I discovered. Um, and I became curious about hydrocephalus because when, as a neuroscientist, when you see something like that, that, that is not what you expect, then, then I want to delve into it further because um, in science, I mean, if you, it, it, it doesn't matter if you only have one data point that doesn't fit the rest. If it, if it, if it is such a, uh, an outlier, you, you, you really have to pay attention to it. And what I discovered was that in the in the literature um, in, in published um, in in science um, of all places was an article by um, a neurologist in England named Dr. John Lorber, and he had written an article about um, is the brain really necessary because he had evaluated this patient 
who had an IQ of 130, and yet he had hardly any brain. His brain looked a lot like the, this, these, this picture here, where it is predominantly fluid in the, in the cavity. This is, a, this is a normal brain from that perspective. And you can see this is, these, this is the ventricles and, and you can see how enlarged they are here. And, and then you can see it from the side, um, huge cavity in the brain. And, and that's such an anomaly that it, it just got buried in the literature and people were not really paying that much attention to it because they didn't know what to do with it. But, but Dr. Lorber actually evaluated over 600 cases of, of profound hydrocephalus. And he found that, um, that half of them had an IQ that was normal or above. Um, and so when I saw that, I thought I need to really revise um, you know, my thinking about, about the brain and, and, and how it functions. It, and the reality is neuroscience has always been an incomplete model anyway. Um, so it, it wasn't really that hard <laughs> to, to, to do that. Um, and so I thought, well, we need to look at, you know, what is it about the ventricles? What, what do we have there? What is left in this skull, in this cavity? And one of the things you have is that the, the ventricles are lined with um, these cells that have cilia in them. And these cilia um, will move at, at, at different rates um, and, and, and in different patterns. Um, and it's just, it's just lined with these. Um, and some people said, oh, it's to circulate the, the cerebral spinal fluid. But if you, if you look at the system, you look at how much cerebral spinal fluid there is and how tiny these are, um, it doesn't make sense that, that they're there to, to, to play a role in circulation. They're doing something else. And this is in what's called the primary cilium. And it, and it turns out that all of our cells actually have, have cilia. And they stick out like this, like a like an antenna. Um, and cilia are actually modified into the various receptors for the sensory system. So the the, the photoreceptors are actually um, cilia that have been um, put into this. This is um, in uh, the fruit fly, and um, this is the mammalian one, which unfortunately is is covered there. I don't know if I can move this. Uh, maybe. Uh, Move that there, um, but it's not going to work for all my slides. So, <laughs> um, and so, what is a cilia? Well, it's made up of a protein that is um, that has two parts to it, and it's a um, magnetic dipole. Okay, and but the microtubule, which makes up the cilia, the microtubule actually has forty thousand of these. And one of the remarkable properties is that it is um, the resistance of the entire molecule, even though it, uh, macromolecule, even though it's 40,000 units, is less than that of the, the, the little the constituent that makes it up. And so, it, and, and the brain is full of these um, and the cilia, um, uh, that's what they are predominantly. And, when you when you look further, one one of the uh, primary um, jobs of the cilia is that they form something called a spindle apparatus, which is what, in cellular division, pulls the cells apart. And when I was looking into Gerwich's work on mitogenic rays, and I saw an image of his of the mitogenic rays. Um, which is this ultraviolet light that he detected back in 1923 in dividing cells, which just, it was, it was a big rage for a while and then it kind of went underground. And now we've discovered that yes, we, we, we do uh, generate and emit biophotons. Um, so when I, knowing that, when I, when I looked at this image and I said, that's a spindle apparatus um, that he saw, then it made it clear to me that these uh, microtubules um, are capable of transmitting light. 
And when you look at the formation of the ventricles, where they come from is actually in the developing um, embryo, the amniotic sac gets um, folded up and in, it becomes inter a piece of it becomes internalized within, within the developing embryo. And, and that's where the initial fluid in cerebus, uh, that's the initial fluid in the ventricles. And this is, shows you at, this is a 13 week um, uh, infant in development. And this is what the ventricles look like. And so what you see is, is early on in development, the ventricles are, they make up the, the majority of the volume of, of the developing brain. And the ventricles are lined with these cells that are basically the stem cells of, of the brain so that they're, they're creating all of the other cells, all the neurons, all of the glial cells, all of them are coming out from that. And um, so that they play a very organizational role in um, the brain development. I have this slide here because we have to think about where is memory stored? Um, and this is an, based on an experiment where a, a caterpillar was taught something. You used a pairing paradigm where you have a stimulus and then you have a, a, another stimulus that's paired with it. And so the, the animal is taught to respond whenever they experience that uh, priming stimulus, when they experience the secondary stimulus. And they did this with caterpillars. And then what they discovered is that when they be became butterflies, the butterflies retained that memory. But what's interesting is that the, the nervous system of the caterpillar turns into this kind of, kind of liquidy goo for the most part. Um, and so it's not about neuron connection once again, that the that, that memory is contained within that goo, within the fluid. And um, I, I see what we're, um, I'm gonna go real fast through these last slides because I want to, at the end, just show you a movie. So here's, here's a, here's a um, coronal section of the brain. You can see you know, what the ventricles look like and how they look somewhat like the caduceus. And of course, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with you know, the, the energies that, that are moving through us and how they relate to the golden ratio, which really dictates the, the development of, you have these double spirals in nature and the, and the development of a pine cone um, in the, the golden ratios is in our anatomy and our bones and you know, in the skeletal structure of our hands. Um, and yeah, I don't have time for all that. Um, and that we, that we have these biofields that are in, in these biofields. And if you look at the development of say an apple, you, you can see, I love the little heart here in the middle. Um, and, but you can see, you know, the, the, how that could under the development, uh, under one of those biofields, you can see how it has that shape. Similarly, the brain has this, you can see how it sort of has that shape as well. This is a, a, a section of the, the apple where you, where you cut it across and you see the radial symmetry and that reminded me of the spiritual eye that people in meditation report that they see. Which of course the, the people, when they talk about the third eye, they, it, it, it originates from evolutionarily, it originates from an actual third eye, which we can still see in some creatures um, and in some lizards particularly. And this, this image of the eye of Ra it, from the Egyptians is actually, if you look at that, that's actually outlining the third ventricle, which is where the pineal gland um, actually resides. Now, in, in, this, in this image here, what you can see is 
the third ventricle here, but you can also see that we actually have fluid. We have this electrolyte fluid that's encasing the brain in between those, those membranes that are magnetite membrane, containing membranes. And you can see that, that, that our ventricles are not the only place where, where we have all of this electrolyte fluid. And what I find interesting is that where the major chakras are associated, you know, we, 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 we associate the, 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 the third eye with this third ventricle. And then if you look at all of this here, that, that's where the, the crown chakra is. And back here is um, the Alta major chakra. So it, it appears that, that these chakras are, are located where we have this water, pooled water that's circulating. And if you look at a baby's skull, they have this soft spot. And it's because their bones haven't fused together. And in fact, it's not just, we, they don't just have one soft spot, they actually have one in the back as well. And so, so you have all of these areas where the bone, which is a dialectic material, meaning that it, does, it, it is an insulator. Um, you, you see that their brains are not as well insulated. So there's more of a connection between these water carrying um, cavities in the brain and, and, and beyond and, 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 and the cosmic consciousness, if you will. Um, and one of the things I, if I have time, what I'd like to do is show you a movie that I think will show you how important water is. Water, what do we really know about it? Science tells us that it came to earth from meteorites, making it an alien substance. And we're only just beginning to touch the surface of what it is capable of. My name is Veda Austin. I'm a water researcher from New Zealand, specializing in crystallography. Over the last eight years, I've been studying water in its state of formation, the phase between liquid and ice, and have discovered something extraordinary. Water appears to intelligently respond to human consciousness. By using its building blocks of ice to design recognizable images, water can share its message or acknowledgement back to us in picture form. Have you noticed a little sailboat is appearing in the ice? Its influence was the thought of a sailboat. My first experience of this phenomenon was when I projected a thought of my hand into a petri dish of water, froze it, pulled it out, and in the architecture of the ice was a hand. I froze some seawater and an image of a fish appeared. I now have over 10,000 macroscopic photos of water responding this way. Here are a few examples that show both the influence on the right and the ice response on the left. I use many different influences from photos, words, music, media and thought. I've even spoken to water and got a written response. The photos you're seeing now were all taken on my iPhone. They were designed by water and crystallized in ice, not photoshopped, not altered. So what does this mean? Could the ancients and indigenous people be right? Could water really be a living entity? You may just find some answers in my latest book, The Secret Intelligence of Water. Let me just explain that, that the video, it's by a woman named Veda Austin, and she is a scientist in New Zealand who has studied the impact of thought on water. And it, it's really a, a, an elaborate um, extension of Emoto's work where Emoto, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work, um, where, and I have a slide of that if you wanna see it, but um, where he would have people think thoughts like uh, beauty or love. And you would see these beautiful crystals that were formed when the water was, um, would, would freeze and, and he would have other people think horrible thoughts 
over water and then crystallize it and you see that it's very amorphous and 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 it looks as ugly as the thought you know so it's showing that water interacts with thought it it, it becomes like a recording of thought and so to, to think of these people who have these huge cavities in their head and they're able to actually still um, navigate uh, the, the world. Um, and it, it could be because of the fact that they have the, the, these essential, you know, bare components that I mentioned, that the, the combination of the, um, the ventricles with, with the water and, 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 and those cells that, that, that line it and the capacity that they have to, um, to, to transmit light. And in conjunction with that, that, that they, there are these, um, there, there's neuromelanin, which, which functions like a semiconductor. So, and, and works in conjunction with that. But I don't, I don't have time to get into that now. But the point is, is that our thoughts um, have an impact. Uh, our and and if you think about why is it that eight hertz or seven point eight hertz, one of the Schumann resonances, why is that such a powerful resonance for transmitting information? Um, it's it's the resonance frequency of water, and healers have had their energy measured, and the the best healers are resonating. Um, at, 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 at eight hertz um, energy. Um, uh, and so there's, there's something extremely healing about that. And we as human beings can go into that resonance frequency and, and have these thoughts that are very, very healing thoughts like Joe talked about and broadcast them because the magnetic waves that are transmitted can go through everything. That there, there, there is that. That was one of the things that um, this uh, medical doctor named Andrea Pukaric. I've, I've been looking at his notes, and one of the things that he he talks about is that these these elf waves are are capable of almost instantaneous um, uh, transmission, and um, and they can go through anything. So I think I'll, I'll end there and 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 um, open up to questions. I would like to start by thinking, saying that one person voiced something that I think all of us can echo. And this was Leticia from Virginia who said, this is incredible and I could listen to you all day long. <laughs> and I'm sure that many other people in our audience today could say the same thing. I have a few questions. Um, and Paul, are you able to see some of the questions in the chat? I am, yeah, I've been watching the questions. Thank you everyone for uh, asking such great questions. Um, Susan, you want me to go ahead with one? Sure. Great, uh, yeah, so here's one from, uh, from Gary. Um, are you aware of any research aimed at investigating the possibility of some of the remarkable abilities found in the subjects that you studied being cultivated in people who don't naturally possess them? Or do you think that it's necessary? There's a necessary connection between the lack of ordinary, you know, faculties or injuries um, that facilitates the development of these kinds of uh, these kinds of skills. I, I think that these skills can be developed by any of us. I mean, I, I, and one of the reasons why I say that is because people have. have have demonstrated it. Uh, there, there are people who said that I wasn't naturally psychic, but I made it my intention. And what you need is you need to have the combination of the intention and the desire with the belief it's possible. And that's one of the reasons why uh, my, in my book, The ESP Enigma, um, I, I really present so much of the science, the physics, the, 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 the neuroscience that, that really um, relates to this so that people can go, well, gosh, I guess it isn't woo-woo. I mean, it really fits in with, with um, and I'm trying to marry these two different worlds because I don't see them as having to be separate. And so, yes, we, we definitely have these abilities. I think one of the things we have to do though is that we have to de-plug from the unnatural 
um, devices and things like that, that, that really um, put us into a, a, a chaos, basically. I mean, and, and really getting back into nature. But if you want to get grounded and you can, put your feet literally on the ground without shoes. Um, it, you, you know, allow the earth's um, electromagnetic field to, to, to have more access directly to your body instead of wearing these rubber soled shoes that really separate us from that because, because we are really, it, you know, it, it, it embraces us. It, it, that, that energy is so healing. The, the other thing is, is that research has shown that we, people oftentimes have more psychic abilities if they are around negative ions. And so where, where do we find negative ions? Falling water. Um, moving water. So it's one of the reasons why we feel so wonderful when we're near the ocean or, you know, or any, you know, any kind of um, body of water, or, you know, or why even I think, uh, you know, and waterfalls, I mean, you know, why people sometimes there's like a cleansing of your aura that occurs when you're in, in that, that pure water. So I think if we, the more, I think that we are all naturally as part of our gift as humans, but we are living in such an artificial world and we're being taught that we aren't capable, we can't do these things, that these things are impossible. And that combination is so toxic. And so I say, clean your body, you know, clean it, get, get you know, get, try to, you know, detox their detox protocols for cleaning out the toxins, you know, clear, clean up your water. And we need to clean up the water of the earth too. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. I have, I'm going to, Mary, two questions here. So the first one is, have any of these savants, particularly child savants, claimed memory of past lives? And with that, how do these savants handle regular life? What helps them navigate? And how do parents get the support they need to help these extraordinary children navigate their lives? Yeah, those, are, those are great questions. And um, what I would say is that the ones who are very psychic, they don't de navigate as well as, I mean, I think that the parents uh, need more help than they're getting currently. Um, the, the educational system doesn't know what to do with these children. And I think that the reason why they retreat is because they are different. They do think about what it must be like to be that highly psychic. It, it's really, it, it's a challenge. And so what I find is that the kids who seem to do the best are the ones who have parents who educate themselves and realize, don't be afraid of this. You know, that, that, you know and so I find that um, the, the parents who come from cultures like India in which it's accepted and, and, and they believe in reincarnation, they believe in um, energy fields and, and and they, and they believe in cities, you know, these special powers and abilities. When, when, when somebody already has those beliefs, then they really, they, they, they see it as, you know, you know, wonderful that their child has this ability and they, and they, and they work with, and that's half the battle is actually having people look at you and not think, oh, you're strange, but look at you and go, oh, wow, what can I learn from you? Uh, how can I relate with you? And do they claim memories of past lives? Yes, they do. Some, you know, not all of them, but definitely. In fact, some of them say that they remember past lives with one another. Uh, wow, well, that's amazing. Um, do do you find that some of these savants, um, the the uh, psychic savants, communicate with other savants that they're not in connection with? Do, so do they hear from other psychic savants and relate to them that way? Um, some of them do. I mean, what's interesting is, I mean, they have to know that somebody exists out there. They have to get on their radar. So um, a lot of the savants I evaluated when I was in India, they they got to know one another because of the fact that, that um, this woman who, who was working with autistic children um, for the government of India, um, she and I collaborated together. And, and so these children got to know of each other. And then, yes, um, there's a woman I met uh, who I learned about because of her having a son who she said she was telepathic with. And it turned out she was um, a, um, a, a social worker. 
And she had a school for children with autism in LA and she was teaching these children, um, you know, regular schooling. But what she found was, is that they were engaging in telepathy with one another. And when she, <laughs> when she figured that out, um, she, you know, she, it, it was quite interesting, you know, and so I, I, I uh, she, she, uh, she, she, that's when I contacted her and I just like, okay, I've got to meet these kids, you know, but, but unfortunately she went through, um, getting shut down because people thought that she was crazy, you know, for claiming these kids were telepathic and, um, and, and unfortunately there's this stigma there and the stigma, the, the stigma shouldn't be, we, we need to destigmatize these things. To me, to me, it's I, I great I derive great comfort knowing that I have a connection with those I love, such that if I'm feeling peace within me, I know everything's okay. Yeah. I'm thinking of the indigo children that yeah. we talked a lot about um a dozen years ago now, I guess, or more. I I've, I've lost sense of time as I age. But uh, there was talk that they were in telepathic communication with each other. I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, you know, a lot of these children would probably be identified as indigo children or even crystal children. I mean, it's what's happening is, is that people are being born uh, that have a different vibration. And, and so I, I think it's really interesting how you, you see the, the, the vibration evolving. So you have, you know, from like I was born in the, you know, when you had violets showing up and, and, and I'm a violet. And, 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 and what you see is that people of the same frequencies tend to want to hang out with one another. I, and I saw as a psychiatrist on, uh, when I was doing inpatient work and you'd be admitting new people, you could almost know kind of what somebody's thing was by who they hung out with because the people with bipolar disorder wanted to hang out. You know, and I hate psychiatric labels, but you know, whatever that is, it's an oscillating current, you know, where the person's going through these emotional you know, swings. So, but, 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 but we tend to find, you know, like, like the birds of a feather flock together kind of thing. Paul. Oh. We have yeah. a lot of questions there. Would you like to pull another one out? <laughs> sure do, yeah. And these are, these are great, great questions. Yeah. Um, so here's another one. So what when these children reach adulthood, um, do they still retain their gifts? This is from uh, Denise in Oregon. And I guess, you know, or what percentage of, the, of these children actually retain their gifts? And is there some um, indicator that you see that makes some of them more likely to retain their gifts than others as they grow older? The main reason, I, I think that there's no, um, there, there's no physiological reason why they would lose their gifts. Um, and what, what it really, I think, amounts to is the degree to which the child is mainstreamed in education and wants to fit in with others. Then, then there's a tendency of these things to go underground. Because b b people, it's just human nature that people don't want to stick out. Does your research suggest the possibility the true locus of memory is the Akashic field and water, the quantum tubules therein, functions more as transceivers between the Akashic field and the physical state? I, what, I, what I think is that the, um, that the Akashic field is encoded in hydrogen. And if you, if, you, if you look at hydrogen, what's unique about hydrogen, first of all, I mean, it's ubiquitous. It's in our air and, and water is two atoms of hydrogen combined with oxygen. But what's unique about hydrogen, when you look at the elements um, in the periodic table that make up physio, you know, bio, living systems, um, what you see is hydrogen is the one that has a proton without a neutron. And the reason why that's significant is because there's no neutron there, the, the, the magnetic um, and quantum properties of that, that proton in the hydrogen can be manipulated. 
the, the, the neutrons has a, a stabilizing effect on, on, the, um, on the atom, on the, on the nucleus of the atom. But when, when that neutron is gone, then what you have in a water molecule, if you think about it, you, you've got these two entang you've got entangled hydrogen. And if you look at the whole water cycle, you know, water is, we, 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 we um, don't break down water, okay? We make water. Trees take up water and break it, break it down, right? They, so it's, there's this cycle be between plant life and animal life that is the water cycle. And there's this, and you have hydrogen in air and you have hydrogen, uh, you know, as I said, you know, a major constituent of water. And so, so I think that, that all of the, if you think about entanglement and how if you affect the spin of something that's been entangled with something, <laughs> you expect then it's going to affect that. I, I think that this is the, the, the overlying mechanism of interconnectedness is, is through that. And that's sort of like, then it, it, in that case, it's so, it's so, uh, it's such that, I mean, it can never, a lot of these things are never really erased. It's just, it, 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 it's just, it's additive. <laughs> that makes sense. Yep. Oh. Yeah, I think uh, that's about all the time we have. Those are great questions. So, and, and thank you so much, Dr. Powell, for, for being with us today. That was uh, really, really amazing. So thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah.